Edgar de la Guerre. Edgar de la Guerre. Amélie Goutte de la Guerre. Elie Goutte de la Guerre. Ned Guerre, Ned Guerre. One, two, one, two. Okay, so welcome back to the Grand Agorda Papa Lifestyle Podcast, the GGPLS Podcast. And today I'm going to do something a little bit different. To cut a long story short, man, 2018 was a tough year for me. I went to four funerals. I went to four funerals in 2018. And I lost six people um, known to me. Let's just keep this real. Six people known to me who I, I, I had time for. And four people who I pretty much loved very dearly. And everybody was um, young, you know, um, nobody a day over 60. Differing reasons, differing causes. Um, I actually got an emotional one. And I remembered on the last funeral I attended, I remembered thinking to myself like, man, I really got to try and work out what I can learn from this. What, what can I take from this? Um, because around that time, I was like just depressed. I wasn't a thing like, yo, when my phone would ring, I would be like, if certain people rang me, I wouldn't even pick up the phone. And what I mean by that, I ain't dissing certain people. It's like certain people are connected to certain people, right? So you know if certain people call you, or, or, or let's put it this way, if somebody's passed away, you know who the call would come from. You know, like um, for me, there's certain people that if you know certain other people passed away, I would have to be the one to call X and Y and Z. That's how the relationship went on. So I would see certain numbers ring and I'm like, I'm not even picking up that phone. I don't want to know. I can't take any more bad news. In fact, I'm pretty sure I remember the very first of all these people who passed away early, early on in 2018. I must have seen the message late at night and I, I flicked it as a WhatsApp. And it started off with something like, I'm really sorry to tell you. And I just turned the phone off and I went, to, I went to sleep. I'm like, I ain't dealing with this now, right before I go to sleep. You know, because I knew what it was. And you can call it cowardice and you can call it any of the above. I'll accept it. I'll take it. Or what I do know is that, you know, my relationships are very deep. And I care about the people. You know, I either care about you a lot or I couldn't give a fuck whether you live or die. And, um, you know, the people I care about a lot, I really do care about. So I decided, you know, that I wanted to do this. I wanted to do some kind of a tribute to the people that I lost, that we lost, the people who also uh, felt love or admiration or consideration, um, had feelings towards these people as well. I wanted to say something about that. Uh, for me, it was a bit of a profound year, losing so many in such a short space of time. And I wasn't really quite sure how to do it. Like everything on this podcast, I have no fucking idea how to do it. So what I decided to do was just to call them out by their first name and just try and outline one thing that I learned from this human being. One, you know, just one of the many reasons why they all were so special to me. Just one thing, you know, because whatever I learned from them, whether you knew them or not, that can be something that you learn from them. And that can be something that goes on to enrich your life. And that, in that way, it goes on to continue to promote the benefit and the blessing that they brought in their time here on Earth. And that's why when people come around today, they were born, I say happy Earth Day, not happy birthday. You know, depending on what you believe in spiritually, you know, we exist. Even if, we, if, what, if you believe scientifically, um, you know, matter just exists. It doesn't disappear. So we always exist. But the day you're born is the day you come to Earth. So, you know, it's Happy Earth Day. So on their time on Earth, these people did some, you know, um, amazing things, had amazing effects on me. Um, and so I just wanted to just highlight just one thing, you know, because obviously I could talk for ages about each of these people. So I'm going to start, I'm going to go in chronological order because that's the best way to do this. So I'm just going to start with Sean. Sean was my big brother, man. I loved Sean dearly. Sean was 
one of the funniest people I ever met in my life. And many people pointed out at his um, funeral ceremony that he was one of the most talented people any of us had met. He could turn his hand to fucking anything. Now, I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. He's a, he would just turn his hand to everything and just fucking master it. The thing that really, I suppose, struck me the most between him and my boy Justin from school, Jay, they were the funniest guys I ever met. They were the two guys who, if I could have my way to direct their careers, I would have had them be comedy script writers. To me, they were the, they were two people who would be the best comedy script writers. You know, they were just so funny, had such an eye for observation and such a wit, you know, that I just kind of figured it was wasted on, you know, the group of people that they were sat in the room with drinking with or shooting shit with or smoking weed with. You know, it was like they had the kind of wit that really should have been shared on television across the nation, across the globe. The kind of insight, the kind of, you know, comic timing. Just amazing, man. That, that And that was Sean. Um, but like I said, trying to keep this, you know, without a, a eulogy to each person. If I really had to go with the one thing that Sean taught me, Sean came up with a counterbalance to who and what I was at the time, um, being a young militant man involved in politics, and told me that we didn't need a radical ideology. Um, what we needed was to espouse the ideology of rationalism. And he espoused this terminology um, called black rationalism as opposed to radicalism and for me it was a huge shift and like most huge shifts not a shift that I embraced immediately but still even at the time I kind of saw what he was trying to tell me because you know we've had this debate about you know how we have to teach our children as black people especially young black men that if the police stop you or you're in an argument with somebody, you don't have the right that other people from other nationalities do to get all angry and and contort your face and wave your hands. Because the moment people start thinking that we're out of control, we end up on that on, on that plaque, um, you know, for Black Lives Matters. So we don't get the right to get angry. Well, with the, you know, with, with the moment we start becoming a threat. Um, you know, it's, it's seven bullets to the back. So I really understood what he was trying to tell me. And also in terms of, um, you know, just in terms of not being that angry, militant, irrational, you know, I'm just angry and mad because things ain't good enough. And no, show them your intelligence. Don't just show them that you're angry. Don't just show me anger. Anyone can do that. An illiterate person can do that. Show them your intelligence. Show them why what is occurring is wrong show them how it can be improved show them that you have a plan and, and this is something that doesn't only apply to black people i i kind of think this in fact you know this, this is kind of set the stall for my assessment of everything now you know i've been around and i'm really i've always been very interested in politics and social change etc and i pay attention to every movement the last movement i suppose i applied this test to was is probably the occupy the occupy wall street movement and there was a lot of shouting and a lot of protests. And in Spain here, we, we had it. We called them the indignados. And they camp out. I didn't really go down and spend no time with them, to be honest with you, man. I had young kids. I was trying to make a living in the middle of one of the biggest recessions the West had seen in like, you know, fucking 100 years. But um, I guess back in the day, I would have gone and, and hung out and talked with people. But the real point was this. Rage against the machine is always great. Um, the machine is often fucked. But what is your solution to the problems? What are you going to replace it with? Because if you don't have an answer for that, or you don't have a viable answer for that, if your answer is a utopian answer, if your answer has numbers that don't fucking add up, then, you know, it's just teenagers letting off steam, man. Or middle-aged people letting off steam, or old-ass people letting off steam. But the bottom line is you're just letting off steam. There's no point railing against a system unless you have a solution. It's really as simple as that. And that's where, you know, that concept of rationalism came in. And I, I apply it to this day, you know, um, to not just get mad, you know, um, hashtag me too. But, you know, I, I get really emotional about that shit. 
but not just to get mad, it's to actually think about, okay, then how does this apply? How does this apply in different situations? Um, what can we do about it? And then I know equally, I get really mad at the people who are like me 30 years ago, who tell me that I have no right to have a voice in that movement because I'm a man. Or even worse, I have no right to have a voice in that movement because my opinions on that movement um, don't align with the opinions of the most militant members of that movement. So, you know, shut the fuck up. And just by that, just by that de facto that I'm not the most militant person in that movement, or I don't have the most militant ideology in that movement, um, I, my, my voice is invalid. Now, all of these things are irrational. You know, when, when someone tries to say that um, sexism or sexual aggression is on a scale like racism or racist um, treatment or racist aggression is on a scale and somebody says, oh, shut the fuck up, you have no right to speak because you don't know how this feels, you don't experience it, and therefore what you're saying, which is evidently obviously true, is invalid, that's fucking irrational, and it destroys the validity of the argument. And that's what my brother Sean was teaching me. Not anger, not militancy, not being a blowhard, not getting attention because you're making the most noise, um, and screaming the most, but being rational rationalism so of all the many many things he taught me he also taught me to cook by the way he's on my list of my my, my cooking teachers amazing fucking cook and i use his technique to this day uh my family thank you <laughs> so you know on the list of things um that he taught me of which have too many to mention i think that's the one i would pull out because i could never be as funny as him so it doesn't matter what he tried to teach me that would never fucking happen but rationalism stayed with me and stayed with me in order to direct the course of my life. And I think made, made, made me a, a much better person and a better contributant to any kind of philosophical or political debate. So if I am a better contributant than I, I would have been, not saying I'm a good contributor, I'm saying I'm better than I would have been. Of all the many, many things I have to thank you for, including one of the best friendships I ever had in my whole life, for that, Sean, I thank you. And also thank you for raising three of the most amazing young men I've ever seen in my life because I'm a big believer that this planet is made up of the sum of its parts. And when you see good, well-grounded, adjusted people entering adulthood, um, you start to feel maybe there is still some hope because most of the days I really don't think there is. So moving on, told you this was going to be emotional. <sighs> Not long back from that funeral, I went to the funeral of the brother of, of, of my brother. I know it sounds crazy. I'm never going to explain it. Some of you will understand it. Patrick, man. I remembered being with my, with, with my homeboy, discussing his eulogy. And I said to him, you know, his brother's had taught me excellence. Well, at the time, I didn't really get zero in on the excellence. I was explaining that as a young man and looking at his brothers being so successful as young, I mean, young, I mean, like under 30, in fact, they were fucking under 25. These young, under 25 black men, massively successful in business, in a business that they ran themselves, making money legitimately, without any form of crime or um, skullduggery or backhandedness, none of that usual shit that was associated with people making money from the ghetto. They had a legitimate business that was booming and they had like, you know, bought nice cars and had nice clothes and went out raving in all the clubs and, you know, they were living that life and they did that shit legit. And I, I remember, I said to him, I don't know if you ever really, you know, knew the massive effect that had on me. I probably never said it because you don't say stuff to your friends. But, you know, I remember like, my eyes were like saucers, like, yo, this shit can really work. You know what I mean? Like, this education shit, this working hard and, and, and find the business um, and, and work hard and pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You know, this ain't just some shit that, like, you know, the, the autocrats or, or the upper classes tell us fucking 
plebiscites to keep us quiet and keep us dreaming um, while they keep on like, you know, um, sipping from the silver spoon. This ain't like, you know, the, this shit actually works because I've got a real life example in front of my own eyes that, you know, the brothers of, of, of my, my brother are out there doing this, man. I'm still in school. And then my other brother, the brother of my other brother did exactly the same thing. He went on, on, on a route with, with um, information technology and computer science and all of a sudden started, you know, flying through the career um, to the upper echelons of that career and, 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 and enjoying the benefits financially and, um, you know, respect wise of being a, a respected member of that, um, you know, fraternity. And it was again, it was like, whoa, this shit is real. Like, yo, stay in school, study hard, focus, work your ass off. And you can actually, in spite of all the fucking obstacles in the way that are trying to stop you from achieving this shit, you actually can achieve an above average lifestyle and without a doubt, a lifestyle that far supersedes what you're expected to gain when your own school teachers didn't even want you to sit O levels. They preferred you to sit at CSEs because they had absolutely no expectations for you to be successful in life. So Patrick, man, that was the first impression, but when I really think about it, you know, as he as as he grew, and I got to watch him, you know, sometimes together with his, like a family by a barbecue or certain things like that, or afar from just knowing what he was doing, I think it was excellence, man. I think what he taught me was excellence. He had a belief in excellence. He had a habit of excellence. I can't talk about his belief structure. I know his habits. He had a habit to strive for excellence. And that's what I've seen when I was younger in the business that he had built with his brother, which was an excellent business and a very successful and profitable business, um, legit and legal business, um, which probably outstripped a lot of people out there hustling and committing crimes, which is an amazing, glorious thing for a young person to see. And, you know, as he continued in his life, um, with everything he went through, he had a commitment to excellence. And that commitment to intelligence and excellence, I think, has stayed with me. You know, um, you don't get anything from any one place. But I think if you really sit back and you think about it, and you think about, you know, the influences that affect certain aspects of your personality, you may realize that, okay, I've got this personality, like maybe say I'm protective of the people I love. And that comes from this guy, that guy, a little bit from her and a little bit from her and you know a little bit from the time I, I was with them you know so with that in mind most definitely I think you know brother Patrick's contribution to my life really was the commitment to excellence something that I have kind of <sighs> I have to laugh man because if you're listening to this podcast you're like thinking what <laughs> I had a thought today, right? And it goes like this. Sometimes, if you ain't willing to do it and let it out badly, it just ain't going to get done. So I understand if my comments on commitments to excellence are laughable, um, particularly with regards to this podcast, because this podcast, unfortunately, you know, you know, I, I love you know anybody out there listening, it's something that I'm building and growing but it isn't the mainstay of my daily focus work-wise. So what I'd say to you is this, the mainstay of my daily focus work-wise, when I'm dealing with that, I am committed to excellence and absolutely fucking nothing less. Now, the things I do with the little bit of time that falls off the side of my 10-hour working day on my main focus of work, my personal investments, um, looking after my, my, my children as a father, being a husband, you know, the little bit of time that falls off the side of that, which I might call, you know, uh, my personal time, which I can do something like this. Yeah, you ain't going to see the same um, commitment to excellence because if I was to attempt to do it, I end up in that rut of um, planning it forever and nothing getting done. And I know I'm a bit of a dichotomy like that. I know there's a lot of contradictions in here, but, you know, at the very least, let's put it this way. If I don't reflect the commitment to excellence that I learn from Patrick, 
it doesn't take away for a second the fact that he taught it to me to understand it, to understand its value and to understand that it is most definitely something to be aimed for, a target to be aimed for and something that really can be achieved. And uh, and everyone's got, you know, different um, ways. But my time with this brother, man, every time I remember it was always very loving, always very respectful, always felt respect around, um, around Patrick, you know. So a huge loss. Um, man, I, I had two of the biggest losses in my life within the first six months of this year. You can believe that was some shit I could have done without. Uh, so, you know. And then, as I, 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 I'm back in Spain, I find out that another guy I had so much respect for and a lot of love for, called Jeff, had also passed away. Now, Jeff, Jeff, to those who knew him, like, look, I've been in Spain 12 years, right? So it's a very difficult thing for me to build the kind of relationships in Spain um, as an adult in 12 years that I built in the UK being born there and growing up with a lot of these people, you know? And, you know, in Spain, I worked, got a family to raise. I kind of kept myself to myself. But Jeff was literally the fucking character out of a 1970s ITV show. You know, he, he's a character out of heartbeat. He's a character out of mind. Uh, he fucking is just, just a larger than life caricature of a motherfucker. And he actually embodied all of those traits. He honestly was the nicest, kindest, most genuine, most decent guy I'd ever met. You know, and I'm not trying to give a backhanded compliment. I want to really make this clear. That doesn't mean that no people don't have faults. And if Jeff had a fault, man, um, he... <laughs> I'm trying to remember how he put it, man. I don't want to fuck this up. He told me once of, of, of a court case where, you know, he's a businessman, Jeff. One of the reasons that we got together and the other reason was that he loved music. So those are the two things that always kept us together. And like I said, for the people who were out here, I didn't get to be, you know, a lot of people know, but there's a, there was a point in time where I would have like, you know, weekly morning meetings with Jeff. So I spent a lot of time, I spent some time with this guy. We meet up in the morning, have a coffee and talk, some, talk run over business plans and stuff. Uh, what he was doing, what I was doing, what was the synergy. And, you know, um, I'm, I'm going to fuck it up. I can't remember how it was. He told me once about, uh, you know, a court case that he was involved in because of a business that had gone wrong. And the judge had said to him something along the lines of, and I paraphrase badly, you know, um, your business skills, your belief in your own business skills are far, um, far more than they actually are. Something along those lines. So he had a wonderful phrase, a turn of phrase. So I had no way of really repeating that, you know, but he told me that story and we laughed and laughed, laughed and shit and giggles about it. But, you know, it was a really a wonderful story because it was um, him doing what he did best, which is self-defecating um, humor and also teaching a lesson, you know, so. What did I really learn from Jeff apart from that? It's not a bad thing to be a fucking good person. I mean, this guy had everybody fucking try to take advantage of him. I don't have the countenance, man. I have a lot of people trying to take advantage of me. I get very hurt. But I suppose I got that flip side, that kind of, you know, repressed violence where it's like, okay, all right, you've had a goal. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've tricked me for a month, for a, a couple of months, five years, psychotic, narcissistic bitch. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, then I'm going to stamp my foot and it's like, okay, seriously, dude, you need to back the fuck out of here. Bad things are going to start to happen. I never seen that button. I never seen Jeff with that button. He would wipe his mouth, dust, that sh dust the dirt off his shoulders and go back. And, and in the morning, he was the same fucking good guy. He wasn't me who'd get moody and upset and depressed and mad and, and, and pissy with the whole world and why people are so fuckery when you just try to be a good person or, you know, why people are so ungrateful when you're just trying to do good for them or who the fuck are these people who wake up in the morning and all they can think of is, hey, who can I go and fuck over today? You know, <laughs> you know, he wasn't that guy. He didn't, he didn't uh, if he had that, which, you know, everyone... 
has sizes that you don't see. Maybe the people doing better that saw that. I never saw that. I saw him go through shit. I saw people manipulate him. I saw people um, mistake his trust. I saw people take his kindness for fullness on many an occasion. Fuck him over, rip him off, trick him, con him, steal his money. And he was still that same nice, cheering, um, generous, gentle giant the following fucking morning. So, you know, I learned that for him. That, you know, maybe it's okay to just be a good guy. You know, maybe you're not being a sucker. Maybe... You don't have to be mad at people taking advantage of you. Maybe you don't have to get your ego offended when people try and treat you like you're stupid or trick you or steal from you. Maybe you don't have to. Maybe you don't. But if I'll ever learn that completely, but it's a good lesson. But that's not the that's not the ultimate lesson I learned from Jeff. Jeff. Mr. Gin and Tonic. I tell you what I really learned from Jeff. I, feel, I wish that was a lesson because it means I'd be much less to crack people's fucking necks, which you know isn't really happening. In fact, with Jeff's funeral, man, there was one thing that made me the most annoyed that somebody that he had warned me about and told me, be careful of that guy, he's very two-faced, used his death as a platform to promote himself and also to kind of diss me. Proving the point, but I'd already known by then what this guy was. But I was actually so fucking mad that somebody would take the death of my friend and use it like that. Um, that I don't think the side of me that would actually throw you off a bridge is going anywhere quite soon. But you know, <laughs> but if but if Jeff's influence on my life had anything to do with it, then it, it would be definitely subsided. But to be honest with you, I think the thing that I learned from him more enduring than anything else in my time knowing him was never give up on your dreams. Because that's what was amazing about that story that he left to tell about the judge. You know, it was that he had been involved in so many businesses, so many business schemes, even in the time I'd known him, maybe four or five, six different. You know, he'd built this amazing community of people around him who loved it, loved him to death. And even if, even if his business schemes didn't work out, because everybody knew that there was no maliciousness, nothing Machiavellian, there, was no, there wasn't a malicious or a, a, a scamming bone in his body. They just understood that, okay, sometimes shit went wrong. And sure, people got a bit mad, but no one ever you know, ran around like, I mean, you know, this is the cost of their soul. This is the fucking con man cost. You know what I'm trying to say? I know of people who have gone into a pub, befriended everybody for two or three months, set up a scheme and robbed every fucker in the pub and then bounced. Do you know what I mean? So we're out here, we get to understand who the fucking rotten apples are and who the ones who, you know, have a bit of bad luck are. And, and he was the one who had a bit of bad luck. And, and people would understand that, you know, but he never gave up on his dreams. And like I said, one of the things that drew us together was our love of music. And he always helped me to promote music in this region, Andalusia, which is something that I've been doing since, um, well, for, I don't know, since around 2011. You know, he always was happy to help me to do that with whatever, you know, plans and schemes he had. But he always really wanted his own venue that he could put on the kind of nights that he wanted. And you know, just like a promoter, I mean, being a promoter is a thankless task. It's one of the reasons I stopped doing it. And he go to these venues and they fuck with you and they change things around. And, you know, if you have a bad night, it's your fault. We don't give a shit, pay up. You, you know, this is the price you agreed. And if you have a good night, they try and rob you and pretend that you only sold half the drinks. So, um, you know, it's so hard to find a good venue that won't fuck you over anywhere in the world. We've had this in England. You know, one of the reasons why one of our most successful ventures is young people promoting in the UK fell apart was that the people we were hiring the whole from started seeing how much money we were making and got jealous and started stealing from us you know just typical dumb fucking shit rather than going wow we've got this whole here doing fuck all and these kids are ramming it and making us money <laughs> I mean why don't we just put the prices up on these motherfuckers a little bit and keep everything running nice no they started scamming the money and it's all kind of stupidness you know so that's that's the life of a promoter but he never gave up on his dreams. And before he died, he finally did get that venue. And I don't know how many years he had it. He ran it for a couple of years. In, in you know, yeah, he finally got that venue where he could put on his own nights, bring on the acts that he wanted to see, um, and put on the nights he'd have. You no, know, he'd have a night with a carvery and certain amount of drink for the price, and you know local bands doing like you know um really good high quality cover bands 
um, putting on music where he knew the people that were in his community, the community that he'd fostered over the however many years he'd been in the Costa del Sol, would come and really enjoy themselves. And they did. Um, one of my favorite pictures, I got a picture of him and, a, and another woman, also another promoter. You know, at one of the events that he put on in the castle in Manilva, I think that time it was the the Jersey Boys tribute band who came over. They were fucking good. And, you know, I, I really treasure that photo. I remember when he died, I wanted to post it. And like anything, I couldn't find it. But I really treasure it, man, because he was a really good person. And I learned from him never to give up on your dreams because he pursued and pursued and pursued for the bullshit, the recession, the con artists, the scam artists, the venues who'd fuck you over, the bands who'd cancel um the, the the caterers who wouldn't turn up over and over and over again and he just persisted because he had this love of what he wanted to do and knew what it would what it looked like and what he what he wanted to achieve and I, I got to see him do it before he died you know um which i was very proud of him very pleased for him and when i look back on it was an immense lesson for me um fourth in this order is Pete. Now, Pete was a whole different character. <laughs> First time I met Pete, man, I was introduced to him and I looked around the bar. He ran the bar, by the way. I looked around at the other people at the bar and I was like, is this fucking guy for real? Yeah, I mean, uh, one of you guys wanted for me to stand up and just knock him out. Um, Pete's, Pete's love, really, not so secret love, very, very public love, was winding people up, was fucking with people, was f pushing people's buttons, was finding what would f completely and utterly outrage them, and then doing that shit. <laughs> and then doing it again, and doing it again, and doing it even more. Now you would find that point, you stick that fucking knife in you, boy, that scalpel in you, and then once he got the, ah, then he started to turn that shit. I know. Sounds like a wonderful guy, huh? He really was. He's a fucking amazing human being. who had an amazing history, an amazing life journey. Um, just a fucking amazing life journey. And, um, and one of the reasons that I, you know, I, I didn't fall for it was because I looked around that bar. And I think I kind of know that bar and I looked at the people at the bar and I was like, nah, if you were what you're pretending to be, these guys wouldn't be here. So I must be missing something. And I didn't, I didn't bite debate. Now he loved political debate and I love political debate. So he, you no, know, he already had me anyway. If, it was, if I was somebody who was like, oh, whatever, have you seen a new town? You know, it would have probably gone all over my head, but he loved political debate. So he would start political debate with a very incendiary topic and a very, very outrageous viewpoint on it and watch everybody jump in and just find their pressure points and fucking pinch them. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> I, was, like, I was halfway there, man. I was like all the way in. But then I kind of thought, no, no, no. So over the course of the time, then I saw some other people there and, you know, the same thing had happened. You know, he did this with black people, did this with um, gay people, and I started to realize, like, nah, because, like, you know, you can't have, like, your best friends as homosexuals, and you kid the homosexuals. <laughs> it's a vague Eddie Murphy reference. Like, you know, I kid the homosexuals because they're homosexuals. Um, you know, but I'm like, no, you, you don't get to have people who hold you in such high regard if you really held views that were against them. So you're obviously fucking with everybody. So as time went by, I learned to find that it was just all a huge, elaborate game, um, which he loved. And he was a very decent guy. And then we did some business. I started promoting some acts um, at his venue. And I found out, direct relation to what I just said about Jeff and promoting, that he was a very honourable guy. You know, that we would promote acts there, and he would feed my acts. And then at the end of the night, he would split that money down the fucking half and give us half the money. Uh, you're the one with the fucking building, the cooking staff, the, the, the you know what I mean? I mean? Like He was like the fucking fiercest promoter I've probably ever dealt with in my whole life. Um, you know, the best part of probably 30 years on and off 
mostly off more than on. Promoting, probably the fairest guy I've ever dealt with. You know, and I had a huge amount of respect for him. Um, you know, just based on that, just based on being a honourable business person. I mean, he'd also created the most fucking amazing business, I, I hasten to add. I mean, his business was astounding, and I guess this is how. And it was, you know, it was amazing from the perspective of, you know, his personality allowed him to do things that, you know, he would have in the same venue people from completely contrasting walks of life. One of the things I remember the earliest was, you know, I would, be, and, and he loved to do this as well. So, you know, I'm this little kid from like, you know, Brock Pocket. I'm from Tottenham. I ain't trying to overplay the, the, the deal. I'm just trying to say that I wasn't born in Windsor and I wasn't educated in Eton. Yeah, we'll just get the picture. So, one day I was there having a drink. He said, oh, come over here and have a sit, have a sit with this, these guys. Have a sit in the chat. And I sat down and I chat with these people. They were lovely. They were friendly. And then they got up and they left. And he goes, oh, yeah, you know, that's the ear to, you know, blah, 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 blah. And another time I went there, he'd be the same thing. Yeah, oh, this is Felix. You know, let's come up and meet Felix. Hey, Felix, hey, do you sit down and have a little chat and a drink, blah, blah, blah. I go, yeah, um, that guy there, he runs this company. It's like, you know, uh, Fortune 500 is a multimillionaire. You know, and he just loved to do that. He loved to connect people from different backgrounds because really, um, probably in spite of, because of all his ability to fuck with people and push their buttons and and, and uh, pretend, you know, that he was the, um, that's what I'm looking for, he, the fact that he played devil's advocate to, you know, their, 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 their political views or their long-held social beliefs. He knew that everybody was just the fucking same. So put them around the table, give them all the fucking beer and they'd all get on with it. I, I met some amazing people. You know, and and everyone who went there, you know, that was the rule. You didn't get to go there with ears and graces. And, and what I loved about it was, you know, let's say the rich people. I don't know if they had to, but I kind of think they had to. They had to take off their ears and graces to go there. So they couldn't go there and be snooty and I am so and so and so. Because he was like, I don't give a fuck. But what was nice about that is that I had to take the chip off of my shoulder and take off of my ears and graces. Of, you know, whatever I think I am, whatever disadvantage I have. Everyone carries their own you know, version, right? So you can say ears and graces, chip and shoulder, whatever you want to call it. And we just met in the middle as people. And it was just related and it was pretty fucking amazing. You know, so he created this environment which would probably never, ever, ever, ever fucking be created again. A lot of it, again, built on excellence. Again, nobody's perfect. He wasn't everybody's best friend. You don't get to be fucking excellent and have excellence by being everybody's friend. You have to be demanding. But, you know, that was, you know, what an environment he created. And on a personal note, man, when the recession came and there really was fucking nothing moving. I mean, the recession came on a business level, man. There's nothing selling in Spain. Uh, we switched up. We're selling in Istanbul. We switched up. We're trying to sell. I was driving like every fortnight to fucking Portugal for a couple of years to sell out there. That, that, that ended. We switched up again. We started driving five hours up the coast to Almeria. When there really was fucking nothing going on. And I was like, yo, I'm going to have to go back to England to make some fucking money so my family can survive and stay in Spain. Um, I kind of, you know, I, I mentioned to him that I might want to do some DJing work. Now, DJing is you know, something that it's, 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 it's a mixed bag for me, right? It's a love-hate thing. I love the feeling of appearing a set and seeing a lot of people have a great fucking night in Garland and go, that was awesome. But I fucking hate it at the same time. Um, you know, and I'm not a big fan of being up till three in the morning playing music and anybody seen in those viral little videos that go around about the DJ, people bumping your decks, people shouting, spitting their drunken stuff in your ear, asking you for requests. Um, and even sometimes drunken women wanting to snog you, all that fucking shit's annoying. Oh, that shit irrelevant. You know, so some, something that, um, I do normally under a pain of death, which this was because I was broke or B, I'll do for friends. Because they're friends, right? You do you do shit for your friends. So I think that's how it started, actually. I think that's, that is actually how it started. Somebody had had a birthday party and they'd seen that I DJed at someone's wedding and I have a really good friend or something. They asked me to DJ at their birthday party. And I was like, okay, that's cool. And I did the birthday party. And then he knew what I could do. Like, I, you know, I like to do the thing where I play for all ages. I don't just go there and play techno all night to six-year-olds and 60-year-olds. You know what I mean? Just because I got a bitch in techno set. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been practicing it for weeks, you know what I mean? That's not that's not what I do. So yeah, do you know what I mean? Um I don't know if I'm telling this story right. But anyway, 
somewhere in the mix of all of this, I've totally forgotten, was my 40th birthday party in which I had the best celebration I could have ever imagined in my life. And I can't remember how it all ran out, to be honest, how it all came about. I remember that I came to him very late in the day because someone else had let me down. This was probably at the beginning of our relationship. I didn't know him very well. And he made an accommodation for me and allowed me to have this party because um, I'd already had a lot of people coming out from the UK, which I, to this day I'm still grateful for. And we just had this most amazing fucking party that even he would talk about it a couple of years later. You know, the staff were talking about it. It was just off the fucking chain. You know, and, you know, the, the kind of guy he was, um, legend has it, the following day after our, um, you know, Caribbean R&B reggae hip hop throwdown, he hosted royalty in exactly the same venue. That's that's who Pete was. But, you know, what did I really learn from Pete, man? I think I learned acceptance. I think I learned acceptance because for all this fucking around and pushing people's buttons and winding people up, he was the person who accepted everybody. You know what I mean? That was the whole point. It's like he played this, you know, he was like fucking Alf Garnet. Um, but not the character. He was the meaning behind the character. I've kind of always said, you know, I play this character to show the ignorance of people that we shouldn't be like, that we should all accept each other and, and, and be tolerant of each other. And he did the same thing that he played this character and he'd wind people up to pretend that he wasn't tolerant and he was, uh, and he wasn't accepting of people, but actually he really fucking was. Um, I don't know if that's the takeaway. I don't know if that's the takeaway I originally had in my mind, but that's the one I got now that, you know, he really taught me to be accepting of people. You know, um, because he really was. And as I said, he did me one of the biggest fucking personal favours anyone's ever done to me in my life. When I say that, I mean, like somebody who don't know me that well, you know, that, you know, I needed the fucking work. And OK, you know, I was good at it, but that wasn't always the reason. As the world is full of, and I'm sure I'll do a podcast if I haven't done one already, I'll do one soon, about people giving people work just because of their relationship, not because they're good at it. And Spain is the home of who you know. So there are millions of people in jobs that they are completely fucking unqualified for because their cousin was doing the recruiting. Sorry, people, but you you, you, you fucking know it's true. From the politicians down. <laughs> you know what I mean? In fact, particularly with the politicians, you know? There was a newspaper report that a politician, that a previous mayor in Manova had employed 700 members of her own family. So, you know, that that's Spain. But he provided me with work, man. My phone never stopped ringing. You know what I mean? So he was an absolute, complete and utter fucking lifeline at a time when I needed it. And when I stopped needing it, he never harassed me to come and do it. He never, ever said to me, yeah, man, when you really needed to work, I always gave you the work. Can you come and do this for me? He was just like, no, things are better. You're not doing that anymore. Okay, don't worry, bro. And every time I ever thanked him for what he had done for me, he just changed the subject. You know, so I can't speak for everyone's relationship with any of these people I'm speaking about. In fact, I can speak the truth and say that I know every person I mentioned in this podcast so far mm -hmm. had difficult relationships with other people. Um, and I'm not looking for rose tinted glasses. Ain't none of us perfect. In fact, at, the, at Patrick's funeral, man, I remember thinking, like I write a lot of songs, I was writing a song along the lines of no one's perfect. Like, you know, please don't be up here eulogizing me like I was some fucking magic theory because I'm a motherfucker. There are people out there who will be like, that, that, that guy, he's a cunt. And you know what? I'm glad because whoever thinks I'm a cunt, they deserve it. <laughs> uh, let me rephrase that. 98% of the people who think I'm a cunt most definitely deserve it. And the one or two or the few who have had that um, unfortunate relationship with me who didn't deserve it, for that I'm truly sorry. You know, um, you can't be you can't be right all the time. But 98% of the people who think I'm a cunt, they deserve it. And and truth be told, if they think I'm a cunt, whatever I did to them was minimal compared to what I wanted to. Do you know what I mean? So nobody's perfect, man. But without a doubt, without looking through life or you know remembering through rose tinted glasses which i really hate because it's so fucking fake i hate people who remember stuff through rose tinted glasses the reason i don't talk about these people's bad points is because it really fucking isn't my place just understand that they had them all of them 
You know, no one was perfect. Everyone had their bad ways, their bad moments, their bad situations, their bad habits, their bad behaviors. Um, you know, would have mistreated people, to treat people unfairly. But without a doubt, everything I'm saying on this podcast with regards to the benefits and the and the enlightenment and the blessing and the encouragement and the help that these people gave me, every single word is true. You know, and I don't really want to highlight these four because, like I said, six people passed away, um, but four I knew intimately. And, and the more I think about it, I don't even really want to go into the other two just to say rest in peace, Paul, and rest in peace, Jake. Because I didn't know you both to the extent that I really think I have the right to speak on you. But I definitely knew you both enough to have been sad to hear that you passed away. Particularly Jake, man, because Jake I hardly knew. But I knew his social media presence. And I'll just say really quickly, what Jake's social media presence did was gave me courage. Because when I wanted to shy away from dealing with certain things on social media, he was fucking right there in its face. Screaming it. And just telling people, you don't like it, unfriend me. Go fuck yourself. And gave me a lot of courage to stand up and just be myself. I tend to compartmentalize. You know, I won't say I've had to. Because everything you do in life is a choice. I just said that I decided to compartmentalize it many, many years ago. You know, to have more than one face for for, for very practical business reasons. You know, for, for, for so, so that the guy that turned up at the, the hip-hop recording studio wasn't the same guy who turned up as the senior engineer at the Fortune 500 company explaining how we were going to upgrade their system. You know, that those two guys... Um, not never twain shall meet, right? So, you know, I compartmentalize, compartmentalize, but he had this amazing way of just being one holistic person. And I saw a lot of that through the way he posted certain issues and dealt with certain things. And that definitely gave me a lot of fire and encouragement and strength. And for that, I'm really grateful. So I didn't say it, man. We all have our different beliefs on life, death and spirituality. So there's really no need to go into that. But what I will say is for all of the people I've mentioned today, man, um, for Sean, for Patrick, for Jif, Jeff, for Pete, Paul, and for Jake, um, rest in peace, man. Rest in peace. You were truly appreciated and truly loved and you most definitely um, benefited this life this one little individual speck in this universe, which is probably a multiverse, you know, you, you, your presence here most definitely benefited and enhanced my life. And for that, I'm super grateful. And um, I don't like to carry regrets. I, I really wish I could have done a little bit more for each and every one of you, but I think that's always going to be the truth for everybody that, you know, you do meet and you care about. And the lesson you learn is to... Get up in the morning and appreciate this life that you have. Shit days, bad situations, annoyances, warts, aches, pains, anger, frustrations and all. You, 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 get, it, you get up and you realise that you know these people who you hold so dearly no longer get to have those problems. Those problems are a fucking privilege, man. So be grateful for your problems. And then work a way to to, to, to go work through them because your life is defined by your problems, man. Someone once said, if you had absolutely no problems, you'd be dead. And, you know, no matter how much we talk talk shit, ain't no one in a rush for that. Um, what was that great statement? I think that was from uh, Marked for Death, that movie. Everybody want to go heaven, but nobody want to die. And that's the real man. <laughs> I think Onyx threw that in a lyric later as well, man. Everybody wanna go, but was it? Everybody wanna go to heaven, but nobody wanna die. Say, me not no, because that me not no was them saying that you know that statement had come um, from a movie where it was uttered by a eyes bulging crazy Jamaican. But you know that's the truth, man. Everyone's always talking about going to heaven, but ain't none of us rushing to die. Um, everyone has their own different belief system as to what happens when we pass away from this earthly plane. But ain't nobody in a rush to fucking try them out. <laughs> so all I can say is I'm super grateful for everybody I've mentioned today who's come in and enlightened my life. And I really, really hope that nothing I've said has been offensive to anybody 
any of their family, friends or relatives. Um, because that almost definitely was not the intention. Um, genuinely giving my opinion about people who meant a huge amount to, to me and had a great influence on me. And um, I appreciate it so much that I just couldn't let a year where, you know, particularly four people I cared about so much passed away. And, you know, just 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 just, just not have a comment on it. I just couldn't. Um, it took me this long to get here because I, I didn't know what to say. You know, I, I was trying to think of the takeaway. And apart from like, you know, life is a bitch, keep breathing. Um, or too much death in one year can make you clinically depressed. I really had nothing to say around the time of, you know, Pete's passing, which, you know, hit me pretty hard. So it's taken me probably the best part of two months to actually find what I actually want to say, which is just this little thing that, you know, here's one little takeaway from the lives of at least four of these people. You know, um, the six that I know personally, you know, who passed away this year and that I was really grateful for having them in my life. And I'm going to try and use everything that they contributed to my life to go forward and make myself a better human being and a better contributant to other human beings on this planet. So that's it. So R.I.P. Sean, R.I.P. Patrick, R.I.P. Jeff, Jif. And R.I.P. Pete, R.I.P. Paul, and R.I.P. Jake. We out. It gaff till a gaff. It gaff till a gaff. I'm in with the till a gaff. In the with the till a gaff. Need gaff, need gaff. Need gaff, need gaff.